ready standing by on stage here. Welcome to the Longmont Museum on the internet. My name is Justin Veach. I'm the manager of the museum's Stewart Auditorium, and we're coming at you live this evening via Facebook, Longmont Public Media, and uh, local Comcast cable channel 8 slash 880. Uh, we're very glad to have you with us this evening, all of you out there in internet land, and we do have a small audience of members and uh, city folk and local community members with us this evening. So welcome to them too. Uh, it's uh, our great pleasure tonight to be presenting this program with the Longmont Multi Multicultural Action Committee. Um, you'll see that we have quite a, quite a few programs in the works every Thursday night at 7.30 live from the Stewart. Um, in the coming weeks we have a, well next week we have a program with Cleo Parker Robinson. Um, she'll be speaking on her 50 years of, of, of taking the Cleo Parker Robinson Dance Company to a, really a national phenomenon, a nationally regarded dance company. Very glad to have her with us next week. We have programs on, more programs on race and social justice with a pair of historians. Uh, coming up, we have a, a crazy talk show called The Long Monster coming up. You won't want to miss that. Uh, we also have a... The Thursday after the election, we'll be having a, no, I'm sorry, the Thursday before the election, we'll be having a conversation on uh, the uh, centennial of women's suffrage, which is exciting. Um, but tonight, we have a very special conversation on the history of race and social justice in Longmont. I'd like to introduce to you now um, Jenny Diaz Leon. She's the uh, co-vice co chair, thank you very much, of the Longmont Multicultural Action Committee. Jenny? It's a little bit of a tongue twister there. Hello everybody and welcome. My name is again Jenny Diaz-Leon and I am a program specialist with the City of Longmont's Children, Youth and Family Division. I am very proud to say that I am one of the co-vice chairs of the Longmont Multicultural Action Committee, or also known as LMAC. So for those of you that don't know, LMAC is a city, excuse me, LMAC is a city council-led um, group that was really created to motivate and inspire the Longmont citizens to take action, both individually and collectively, and we promote inclusivity, cultural understanding, and involvement. LMAC was created specifically to address all of the diversity related issues in our community and our goal is to maintain Longmont, a community where we all belong. The Longmont Multicultural Action Committee sponsors several events, some of those including Day of the Dead and the Dr. Martin Luther King Day celebration. Many of you have probably attended our signature event which is called Inclusive Community Celebration. Has anybody been there? All right, lots of people. So through the Inclusive Community Celebration, uh, Longmont community members are able to not only highlight, but also educate the Longmont community members on their different, cultures, their different cultures and traditions. The evening is filled with lots of delicious food, dancing, music, and above all, community building. Now with that being said, I'd like to take some time to thank you all for participating in today's conversation and being present. And I'd also like to thank the Longmont Museum for inviting the Longmont Multicultural Action Committee to be part of this event and to partner with you. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you tonight's moderator, Rosana Longo. Rosana is a bilingual equity reporter with KGNU Community Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Museum of Longmont, Longmont Museum. And thank you, Jenna Diaz-Leon, for introducing me. It is a pleasure to be here amongst incredible activists, people from the community that are so strong. And today, to talk about something that is extremely important, I recently had the opportunity to produce podcast 
through, you know, thanks to KGNU, our community radio, power community radio by the listeners, you, the listeners. And when I did the podcast about diversity inclusion, I heard this phrase that is so strong that I want to share with you. That is, if we don't look at race in the eye, we will not solve the problems of America. And that got stuck in my heart when I heard. Today, I am invited to this amazing panel discussion called Voices of Change, a History of Race and Social Justice here in the city of Longmont amongst local leaders and activists that have gathered to give their perspectives of Longmont's history of race and social justice and in an effort to create a more equitable and inclusive community. I don't want to talk more about, you know, what's in my heart right now. I'm super emotional. I want to make sure that I go and introduce each of you as briefly as I can. We have today Linda Arroyo Holmstrong. She's a Latina edu educator and a, Lat and a passionate about Latino history project. I have seen Linda, I have seen Linda being this strong Latina with roots deep, deep in Colorado and also in New Mexico. She is a community historian, a force of the Latino History Project that continues to present and facilitate workshops to emphasize the history utilizing Latino sources. She's also a broad board chair, a chair of the El Centro Su Teatro and also part of the Colorado Chitaqua Association board member. Welcome, we Thank wanna you. welcome Linda Arroyo Homestream today. I also have Lauren Jenkins, African-American entrepreneur and community CEO of, of Mini Money Mark, Mark, Management, and an app that helps teachers educate children on finance literacy, super important. He worked in foreigner exchange in London, and you decided to leave the finance world to pursue your passion for teaching self-motivation responsibility and financial awareness to young ones, teachers, parents, amazing. Mini money, uh, mini money management, sorry, <laughs> come from a, you know, came from Helen Ross, your mother, that played games with you. I really want you to tell that story. It touched my heart. That's incredible. We also have Louis Lopez, I have seen you in action, Louis, a community coordinator, a meditator too, from the city of Longmont Children Youth Family Division. He oversees the GANS response and intervention program. Louis Lopez has united the community and acknowledged the growing gang problem, increase awareness and empower parents to realize where and how are those warning signs that we need to watch? He also helped youth get out of the gangs and get track to a better life. Amazing. Applauses. I want applauses for everybody. Um, Linda Robinson. Yes, Linda Robinson, African-American activist and ordained minister, Longmont Multicultural Action Committee, graduated in California State, with a degree in criminal, ju criminal justice. Uh, you're a holder of multiple awards for the community because of your heartfelt, heartfelt concern and sense of social responsibility, serving in many boards, and also you, you are also recognized, Mr. Robinson, as the founder of Dr. Martin Luther King week-long celebration. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> We have big people today. Brett Lee Shelton, a member of the Oglala Zouk tribe. Did I pronounce it correct? Oglala Sioux tribe. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. 
Lakota and Cheyenne ancestors worked at the American Rights Fund on Indigenous Peacemaking Initiative, extensive experience in advising tribal governments, agencies. You know, you are this researcher attorney in, that analyzed policies for the well-being of the National Indian Health a grassroots organizer for this international need of awareness for our people and to stop everything that has to do with violence. It's an honor to have you. you. It is an honor. And I want to quickly uh, go to the questions right now and the questions that we have here for you. And please feel free to answer them, whoever wants to do it. What is Longmont's history of race of, and social justice? And I think this is super important for us to hear from you. I, I just wanted to start out by saying um, I've been involved with the Boulder County Latino History Project, and um, we have a website. We've published two books, and um, there's a community website that you can access, but it really, we have primary documents. Um, did a lot of research, oral histories, et cetera, and um, you can get a lot more information in the books that are still available on Amazon. But um, some of the interesting and tragic things that happened in, in Lama um, go back to, to the 1920s when um, the Great Western Sugar Company started recruiting uh, Mexicanos from Mexico and Mexican Americans from southern Colorado and northern New Mexico. And they were brought here, of course, as labor. And um, sugar beets are a highly intensive crop that need, they're very needy. And so um, these laborers, it was considered stoop labor where they were on their hands and knees, either planting, weeding, culling, or, and then eventually topping the sugar beets, dangerous work. Um, but they, low wages, of course, living conditions, substandard, unsan unsanitary conditions also. And um, a community member, Ramon Montes, uh, ended up leading um, and organizing a strike. And then they picketed. And, yeah, exactly. Que viva la huelga, no? Um, so they went on to get... 26 people were arrested, and six of the people arrested were women. But they were not only dealing with these lousy conditions, but they also were dealing with uh, a local government and a state government that was run by the KKK. And so Lama was no exception to that. And the mayor, s some of the city council members and school board members were also um, members of the KKK. And so with this atmosphere, um, in fact, they even put up a red cross on, I think, 4th and Main, um, and they hung their, the KKK flag on the official city flagpole. Um, so there was intimidation, and um, many of the businesses um, said white trade only, no Mexicans, no dogs, and a, a lot of these accounts are by people from the community. And so as part of the work of the Latino History Project, we focused on three communities, Longmont, Boulder, and Lafayette. And so um, one of the big things I think is that um, we really need to educate ourselves about our past. And um, what's been wonderful about this project is that we our, uh, we have a website, we publish the two books, and we're th we also do teacher training. So St. Vrain and Boulder Valley School District have been involved in this workshop trainings where teachers are exposed to the website and where they're able to include this in their curriculum where we can reflect our histories, all people's histories, and it's long overdue. <laughs> I would like to add to that, thank you, thank you for that history from 1920. I've been here 40 years, my God, <laughs> doesn't seem like quite that long. 
but we moved here in 1980 because of IBM. We called it the I've Been Moved Company. <laughs> so we got moved, and, and we, they always said, you, you're, you're going to be doing time, and you have three to five. Most people have a, a specified time. So we had three to five years here. But um, 40 years later, <laughs> here we are. A couple of significant things happened when we got here. Um, my husband was with IBM. He, he, we came in, my daughter and I came in on a Sunday. I was pregnant with my now 40-year-old son. <laughs> and uh, he was sent to Lexington, Kentucky that Monday uh, on an assignment. We got here Sunday, Longmont. I thought, my God, it, God, are you in this place? What, <laughs> what are we doing here? Because we were in a new home, we, I had not met any, any people, and I didn't see any African-American people except Betty Nunnally. Betty Nunnally came over and said, would you like to go to the store? And I'm thinking, store? Yes! That, that's a good thing. You mean they have stores here? Because at 9th and Main was that old corner pantry market. I don't, some of you may remember that, or you may not. But anyhow, so we started our lives here. My son was born at Longmont United Hospital. He probably was the first, I don't know, never mind. He, anyhow, he was born 9-11-80. Um, and then later that year, I think maybe in November, two young Latino for, uh, young men, I'll, I'll say, were shot by police officers. And um, the, uh, Juan, Car Juan Luis, I think, and, and Jeff Cordova. And I started thinking, what in the world is going on? Because shortly thereafter, my nephew was killed in, in Signal Hill, California, by the police with the chokehold, which is the very reason that the chokehold is outlawed in Los Angeles County. It took five years of a trial to prove that he did not commit suicide, as they, they claimed that he did. Um, Johnny Cochran was our lawyer. We won, but we didn't really win because he lost his life. And shortly thereafter, my sister, uh, his mother, died after the trial was over. So I'm thinking in all this time, what, God, you brought us to this God-forsaken place. Two young Latino males have been murdered, and now my nephew is murdered. What, what is going on? At that point, I think I met Marta Moreno, and, and then later I met Carmen Ramirez, and and uh, Dan Benavides, people began to do things, to be active. And of course, since I was, I was from the 60s, marching with Dr. King in the last two marches, the I Am A Man March, and then the uh, Memorial March, we gotta do something. I, I, you know, I, I had such a kindred spirit with these people, knowing that you got to do something. John Lewis said, say something and do something. And that was what I was motivated to do then. I'll stop now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda and Glenda, for sharing that, sharing these deep stories, these real stories. Um, I would like to also allow somebody else, if they want to talk about this history, yes. Uh, Luis Bernardo Lopez Jr. And um, I just want to say, you know, I'm honored to be here with um, you today in this panel and um, done a lot of work with Linda and it's been, a, that was really a, a really amazing um, opportunity to look at our history and be part of, uh, yeah, just connecting in a, in a deeper way. There was a lot of people involved in that, that project and, you know, um, a lot of fun and a lot of uh, history that was we were able to like really uh, reflect on. Um, I'm going to take us back and just be, I'm born and raised in Longmont. I was actually born in the same house my mother was born in. 
and I was the last grandchild born in the house that my sister was born in, my mother was born in, and the house still sits there at Kensington Park. Uh, 666 Kensington was the address, and they recently changed it. I think they 669 now the address. So. But yeah, um, so um, one of the things I just want to just reflect on is just like being born into the struggles of what our parents and our, our ancestors and, our, and our, um, the people before us have, have um, brought to us. That lives inside of me. That continues to be generation, generationally instilled into, you know, the way uh, we live and how we live. Um, one of the things I can remember as a young man is being told the stories of, yeah, um, no dogs, no, no Mexicans allowed. And then hearing my father talk about, like, um, going to eat in a restaurant, and they actually told him that he couldn't eat there. And working construction, he was um, with a construction crew, and his construction crew supported him, and they all walked out and went to a place where they all got to eat, but they were just really um, supporting him in a way of brotherhood, but really just feeling those stories that they had to live that. They had to actually be in, in community, in this community, which wasn't too long ago, that really um, uh, created resilience. I think my mom is also part of this, one of these, uh, is part of this leadership that I've grown up with, with strong Latina women, strong Latina men that have changed um, the direction and the path of a lot of change that has happened over the 40 years. Um, I remember as a little boy um, being in meetings where um, long, uh, um, long meetings, uh, seven years old, and people were voicing and coming strong with wanting to make change. We had people from CU, um, professors, and we also had attorneys that were working pro bono and looking at how to actually get involved in our communities. We were working with Boulder, Longmont, Lafayette, and they were working with Longmont. But as a young boy, I was hearing all this energy that was being transmitted. Um, and, you know, it actually, I never knew that I was going to be following this work, but, or that work, but it was what they said in motion was to actually create the platform for a continual um, change. So continue, continue change. Thank you so much, Louis Lopez, for sharing that, and also calling on the energy or of your mother, um, you know, because of her activism. And I would like to also allow uh, Lauren, uh, Lauren, to speak to us about, you know, what uh, you think about the history of race and social justice here in Longmont. You being an African-American. I heard once that somebody said to me, we were stolen, we were, we were brought here, we were stolen from our lands. So this, and then the segregation that you are mentioning. Um, I'm probably gonna leave the history piece because I moved here when I was six. So I'm, I'm 25, so I obviously don't have the same um, history as these guys do, but when we start to talk about the present, I'd love to, to kind of chime in and tell that story. So. Okay, yeah. excellent. But yes, I, it is super important to hear from you, Brett Lee Shelton. This is super important that you tell us histori the history behind racism. Right, absent any, any personal experience, um, I'd like to point out that prior to all this history, this was the, was the site of a very successful ethnic cleansing. Um, there were Cheyenne and Arapaho, at least people who lived here uh, since time immemorial. And you can look at the land here and the richness of the land with all of the different water sources that are running and healthy and all the different things that grow. And then the transition zones of the vegetation up when you get to the foothills and so on. And you can tell that there's a huge carrying capacity of this land here too. You can see along the, along the uh, riverways and creek beds, all the berries growing all the time. And if you know what to look for, there's all sorts of food. You would never starve if you, if you know what to eat around here. Um, just based on what the land provides. And so you could, it would be safe to assume that there were a lot of people here, right, in this area. Um, we, we've, we know that there's a strong Arapaho history and probably a strong Cheyenne presence, but um, 
this whole area of Colorado was kind of a central meeting grounds, really. And there's all sorts of stories about all sorts of tribes from farther than you can imagine they came from coming to the Denver and Boulder and North areas. In fact, I have ancestors that are buried up um, by Fort Collins, um, and people don't think of that sort of, of, of an influence either, but there's, uh, there's probably all kinds of tribal histories here. And it, the, the ethnic cleansing was so successful that we don't know about that very much at all. Um, we, we don't learn about it. Um, people who go to school here didn't learn about it. And, um, and there's hesitancy to even, even tell the truth yet. And so we're starting to reach a point where the truth is coming out. And um, I'm looking forward to, to what we have to learn there. And I'll have more to say about how we can move that forward too. Thank you so much, uh, Brett, for saying that. What comes to my mind is so a beautiful phrase I heard from a young one saying, we are here, we are not history, we are alive, we are still here. This is our land. Thank you. So now that you have all spoken, I really want to now ask the question, where are we now? And I want to just mention quickly something that I recently translated for a, you know, from a headline of an event, a sad event here in Longmont of an immigrant without documentation that was punched in the face. And this recently happened and with, you know, the problems that we have now with the pandemic, COVID-19, COVID and the other pandemic that somebody said to me, the racism pandemic that we are experiencing, the police brutality that we are experiencing in a year of election too. So if you can please, please uh, go ahead and talk to us about where are we now and what do we need now? Um, I guess I could start us off. So my mom moved us here when I was six, and so she grew up in St. Louis. My dad grew up in New York, and she wanted me to grow up in a place where race wasn't an issue because of where she grew up it was. Um, and so I think that was the best and the worst thing that could ever happen to me. So I didn't know I was black until probably fifth grade. Um, until probably third grade, I thought I was Latino. Like my mom was like, oh, like, or what's it like being the only black kid? I was like, mom, I'm not the only black kid. There's Jose and Pedro and Juan, <laughs> <laughs> because they were the kids who looked the most like me. And so I think it was unbelievable growing up here, but at the end of the day, there, there's a term that we always use growing up. Like we're in a bubble. We used to call it the Boulder bubble, but now it's in Longmont. And you like to act like nothing happens. So we, we like to shy away from race. We, we don't like to have those hard conversations. And I remember being in sixth grade and that was the first time we had our, our history unit where we talked about slavery. And from sixth grade onwards, I always dreaded having that history unit come up because the teacher would look to me like I knew what I was talking about. And my thing is, is I grew up here. I've been here since I was five, six years old. So this is the only thing that I know. So how would I know more about slavery than you would? And as you start to grow up, you start to see that there's a difference, but nobody wanted to address it. My hair would look different. My, I was raised a little bit differently. We would eat different food, but it was never something that teachers or parents or even sometimes other kids were comfortable with discussing. So if you look different, you act different, you just brush it under the rug. And I think it's amazing that we're in a spot where it's starting to change, but people in this area, in this quote unquote Boulder, we kind of call it the Boulder County, County bubble, they don't want to have those conversations because it makes them uncomfortable. We're always uncomfortable, but you got to start having those conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for what you have said. Exactly that, if we don't look at the eye, um, racism in the eye, we're not going to solve this problem. I also would like to ask you, and whoever wants to answer this question, was there an event or moment that inspired you to do this work? And I'm looking at Glenda and I feel that I should ask you this question. Yes, I was a 19 year old junior at Memphis State University. We were marching for basic human rights, for garbage workers. These men were treated like animals and they invited Dr. King to come to Memphis on behalf of the garbage strike. And he, he said no. He, 
it just was so much going on between the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 had passed. People died, too, by the way. I might throw that in. People died for this basic right to vote. And then so in 68, uh, the clergy in Memphis invited Dr. King to come. He said no. But whenever somebody died, he showed up. And these two men, well, let me just go back a little bit, because black men were not able or allowed, I'll say, to ride in the, in the garbage trucks. It w they were driven by white men. Black men had to hang off the back of the trucks. And I remember this, this season like it was yesterday, because it was sleety and cold and rainy. February 1968, and the garbage men were talking about having a union. They, they wanted some basic rights. But um, the mayor wasn't hearing it. He would not allow any outside agitators to come in. And so in the course of all this, the strike and all that, these two men, Robert Walker and Echo Cole, I say their names because I don't ever want to forget their names because they too gave their lives for the freedoms that we enjoy today. To get dry out of the sleet and the cold, they climbed in the back of the garbage truck with the garbage. Someone walked along and flipped the garbage switch and those two men were ground up with the garbage. And at that point, Dr. King says, I'm coming to Memphis. I will lead the sanitation strike. I don't care who they are. They're human beings and they have value and they have worth. And so I was, like I said, I was 19 year old junior. The few of us that were at Memphis State, the African American students, decided to form a, a black student association and we were the ones who helped the older people um, organize, get organized in the march. And as I sat there, I thought, these people are, are marching just for the right to be treated like a human being. And so they made $1.90 an hour, and they had no benefits, so they worked from the time they were 30 and 36, as these two young men were, until they were 75 and 80 years old. Two and three families, generations living in one household just to survive. And Dr. King was like, this, this is not right. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so he did come and he did lead the march. And as many of you know, this was March 28, 1968, that supposedly erupted in a riot, much like what's happening right now. But 10 men were paid, 10 thugs, I'll say, black men were paid $50 each to disrupt the nonviolent march and prove that he uh, did not have the ability to do that, to conduct a nonviolent march. So that march, the I am a man march, ended in a riot. It just went awry. At that point, Dr. King was whisked away, flew back to Atlanta and said, I only do nonviolent marches. We're committed to that. We were trained not to fight back. Doesn't matter if people spit in your face or what they do to you, kick you, whatever. You do not fight back. And that was effective. That was one of the most effective forms that turned that Montgomery bus boycott around in 1955 uh, that started all of this. And so um, he went back to Atlanta and said, I will be back, and I'm coming back to conduct a nonviolent march. Of course, many of you know he came back on April 3rd, 1968, and standing on the balcony balcony of the Lorraine Motel on April 4th, he was shot and killed, murdered, for the freedoms that we're all enjoying today. 
This is why people say, why, why we celebrate Dr. King? Why don't we celebrate anyone else? This man gave his life for the freedoms that every single one of us in this country enjoy. Thank you so much, Glenda Robinson, for that remark. Really to the point, and also brings us to the today, the moment, the moments that we are living when we have a law, when we have seen, we have seen all these protests rising in the middle of a pandemic and of a, you know, so difficult people going out. And I would like, if you would like to talk about that also of what we are experiencing now as a young person, Lauren, I would really like you to talk to us about the events that you have seen lately surfacing, requesting equality and humanity. Um, I think as a young person growing up and seeing the police shootings and, and seeing young black men and women and older black men and women being murdered and discriminated against and stopped. And it, it, it genuinely makes you feel helpless. And so there's a reason that before this, I didn't, before the last couple of months, I didn't do talks like this. But the reason that I started the company that I started is to teach people about money. Because my thought is if we can get people of color out of poverty, then at least I'm doing my part to make that step. So it's always been in my heart I think that I was, I kind of say I was born with a silver spoon. Like I had great parents. I was born in a great area. And so it's, it's up to me to be able to do something. Um, and so for me, it was Ahmaud Arbery who made me say, you know what, like I need to do more than, than, than just start a company. I need to be, be out there speaking and talking to people because he was the same build as me. He was the same age as me. He went running and I'm a runner and he got shot. And if you look at it, his name's not mentioned anymore. It's just another news cycle. And people need to realize that this isn't just a news cycle for us. This is something that we experience every single day. And I right. put, there's, there's songs that have come on from artists that I love and I play it for some of my friends and it talks about like, you know, black rights and like, you know, people of color having those rights and like, oh wow, like when did this song come out? I said five years ago. Like I've been listening to this song for five years. So like, wow. And, and so for me, it's, I feel like I'm lucky. I grew up here and I may have looked different, but I was never really in any danger because there weren't enough black people for us to be a threat. I can't say the same thing for the Latino community because they did have to experience that. And so, so for me, I have to do something. And that's why I'm here. Thank you so much, Brett. Thank you. Thank you for what you have said. Thank you. I think that at this moment, I would like Linda to speak about the history of the Latinos in Longmont. You know, going back to what you expressed at the beginning, why? Because look at us right now, experiencing what we just experienced. Make, please, a reflection around this. I think it is important because we're talking about that now. Yeah, I think um, in the 1930s, um, during the Depression, then all these laborers who came to support the economy of local economy, economy and state economy of Colorado, um, the tide had turned. It was during the depression and they were no longer needed. And so there was a whole different feeling towards these people who at one time were the essential workers and um, and then they were seen as taking away jobs from Americans. And um, so the city, the uh, county commissioners of Boulder decided in 1932 that they would be very helpful and they would repatriate these people back to Mexico, back to the El Paso, to the border. And they worked with the railroad company to make that happen. So there were roundups here in Longmont and all the agricultural communities, severance. Um, and so um, my, you know, my family history is that we, on my mother's side and my father's maternal side, we have deep roots that go back 
you know, 12, 14 generations to the Southwest. But my grandfather, Arroyo, was an immigrant from Mexico, and he was the head of the household at that time. And so if you were from Mexico, head of household, you were asked to leave. And so they paid $8 per person to have them repatriated, which to me is really deported. And um, they were picked up in cattle trucks and hauled to Union Station in Denver. And it was, um, you know, I think a lot of people of color have been forced to forget these times, to hide it. I never heard this when I was growing up. I never heard my grandparents speak of it. But I do have references to it in a biography that my grandma wrote about being in Mexico in, in 1932 to 1934. Um, I have a secondhand account from my, my Aunt Esther who did hear this story. That's how I found out that my grandparents were part of this and my father. He was two years old. It was a humiliating, uh, traumatic event. And I think that um, we haven't come very far. I think that the whole idea of, of, you know, I think about DACA students. I had, you know, I'm a former educator, retired educator, and I think about my, many of my students are DACA. And so it's like there is so much we need to do yet. And unfortunately, um, with our recent administration, um, I think we're, um, have, the tides have turned and it's pretty ugly. So I think it's time to take more action. And that's why I continue to be involved with the Latino History Project and do events like this. And so, um, Become educated and do what you can on a personal level. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. Yeah, become educated is, I think, the one of the most important things. And I would like to, you know, say, excuse me, I'm sorry, Brett Lee Shelton. I, you know, I have you, I have your bio in front of me, and I'm super impressed about everything that you have done. And I would like for you to make a comment about what is happening right now with our indigenous people, our native people here, especially in Colorado. They are being affected so much by COVID-19 and not feel supported. So if you can make a comment about that, because that ties completely with the story of Linda just shared of, you know, all these people coming here to work and then being dispossessed of land and the right to live a, ha a happy life, a good life. So, um, yeah, there's uh, a pretty, pretty high prevalence, I guess, of COVID-19 in some tribal populations, some communities, and um, the mortality rates higher than, than should be, higher than other, other statistics. This is kind of normal for Native Americans, though. We, we generally have the highest of all the bad statistics. Um, a lot of times that's not known because our populations are so small that we're generally st statistically insignificant, so we don't make the reporting. Um, but if you look at where my family's from, the Pine Ridge Reservation, we're perennially in you know the, the top county in, in all the negative health indicators and, and in the top five of lowest per capita income. Um, and so the factors of, um, you know, of, of extreme poverty, of not healthy food, of um, deficient health care, um, and then of insufficient housing, we, it, it's not uncommon to have 20, 25 people living in a three-bedroom house on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, um, three, four families if there's three bedrooms, um, a family per bedroom at least, um, and the living, living room's another family. So. Those conditions are a good way to spread any sort of a contagion in, in a pandemic. And so you see that happening. And, and similarly at other reservations, the Navajo Nation made the news pretty prominently across the nation. And that's, that was early on. It was an early wave. The tribes are doing what they can to fight it because they realize the risk. But it's a very real threat. And, you know, it's tough to see a way out of it other than 
buckling down. We've attempted to set up road roadblocks on our reservation just to verify that outsiders aren't coming in for some un unnecessary reason so that they don't bring the virus in more. And those roadblocks have been challenged by the governor of South Dakota as illegal, as against our jurisdiction. So we're not even, she doesn't want us to be able to protect our own family members from the disease um, because she wants to make a stand to, to appear like she's in line with the president for her political aspirations or whatever. But that's our relatives that she's sacrificing by, by challenging us. So that's, that's a snapshot of the COVID-related stuff that's going on right now for, for our communities. Thanks for asking. Yeah, it, and it is super tough. Uh, recently, Maeve Conran, our news director, interview somebody that brings, you know, uh, food and resources to the community. And uh, the expression, something that I'm never going to forget is this point that as many times people donate things that are broken, things that are dirty. You know, taking away the humanity not understanding that there's people that really need um, the support, that they don't have electricity, they don't have the water, they don't have all those basic things that we take for granted. Thank you so much for what you have said. Now we have the question in front of us, where are we heading now? Is there a reason for optimism? Any cause of concern how can we change things? And what comes to my mind, to my mind is to ask you, uh, Lou Lopez, Louis Lopez, what can we done? You that you have um, helped young people come out of you know turmoil. What can we do in this situation that we are facing and that we are living at this point? Thank you. Um, I'm optimistic. Um, just like learning from the history of our elders and our leaders from the past, you know, they, uh, they have given us, uh, and I really feel fortunate in Longmont that they were able to really work together and really develop relationships to really communicate and help um, outreach and provide um, resources to families and young people. Um, but I'm really optimistic with the young people and the new generation that's coming up that are, you know, um, not silenced and they um, have voices and the energy that's coming with these young people is they are not going to sit down and, and wait. They're going to really embrace the moment and really have questions that need to be answered, answered. And I really think that, you know, we need to get behind them and have our the, the people that were former leaders, support them and just be at their back, like the generations before us. We are kind of guided by the generations in Longmont that have encouraged us to do what, our work. So it's now time for the young people to, you know, really have that opportunity to thrive and, and make change. So I'm really optimistic about that. So, and, and they're our future. And um, what you see now, it's young people and not just of one culture, it's many cultures coming together to support each other and really fight for um, justice and social justice and, and you know, peace, so. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Hope, that's wonderful. Glenda, so, the same question, sorry. Uh, well, I always say freedom, freedom is not free. Somebody died for us to enjoy what we enjoy. And so it's incumbent upon each of us, and yes, Louis, I, I am encouraged by these young people that are saying, I'm gonna do something. I don't know what, what I have to do or what I will do. So it's incumbent upon us to tell the stories of our history and let them know the prices that have been paid we can pass the torch, but I think we've done uh, somewhat of a poor job of telling these stories. Just like Lauren said, uh, sitting in class and, and, and you think you're Latino because you don't see anyone else there that looks like you and, th and these are your friends. Well, shame on us for not telling our history, where we came from, how we got here and how we got over 
And, and it's so important for them to know. I heard, I've, I've talked to a lot of young African American people at our church and they said when Black History Month rolled around, they just wanted to open up the floor and crawl in it because everybody was looking at them like they knew something, just like you said, and they're like, we don't know anything. We've been here since we were babies. So we got to tell the stories of the prices that were paid. They, they'll, they'll do what they need to do if we, if we give them the torch, but we got to give them something to work with. We got to tell them what happened in the 1920s. We got to tell them, my grandfather in 1860, he was born in 1860, so he was an enslaved African-American male. At age five in 1865, as a result of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, he became a citizen and then went on to become a professor. He, he went to some white men and the AME church took him to college. Everybody in my family, and it's a huge family, needs to know that story, but not just our families. We've got to tell them about your families and your family and what they did. These were courageous, visionary, powerful, strong people. And I say, but for the, since I'm a minister, but for the grace of God, we would not have survived. We survived insurmountable things. And so, yes, the young people can handle it, I think, and they are reaching for the torch, but we got to give them the tools that they need to work with and let them know that the price was paid for with human life for them to take that torch and go on and make a difference. Thank you so much, Glenda Robinson. Excellent. Please, Brett, what is it that we need? Is there hope? Any process of reconciliation requires an honest and deep truth telling. And that's what needs to happen with America. And until that happens, it's doomed to keep repeating itself. And so, so we need to go back and tell, we need to find out in some cases even, and, and tell the ugly truths. And that's very uncomfortable for people who exist in positions of privilege that resulted as, as, as a result of some of the horrors that happened over the past history of this country. It's, it seems to be tough for people to have that status threatened in some way, or, or to even a lot of times admit that they sit in that position of privilege still um, that was gained through those processes. But we need to be honest about the roots of that. And once we're honest about the roots of it, only then can we move, start to chart a course forward. Um, we're lucky when we tell the history of these different groups because um, not only do we have the ghastly stuff to look at, but by this time we have a bunch of heroes to look back at that, that you're talking about. And um, so that can give us more courage moving forward because no, we know that others have pushed forward for us in the past already too. I mean, I'm, I'm probably, I consider myself like second generation after the American Indian Movement, which was part of the Civil Rights Movement. And I look back to those people as heroes who opened the door for me to go to school, but it's my job to pass on um, what I can to the people younger than me now, the people in their 20s and, and kind of catching their own, their own rhythm moving forward. But we can't do that effectively until we tell the whole truth about what really happened. Um, and that means going back farther, farther yet, going back to the ugly stuff. And face it, thank you so much, Brett. Thank you. Thank you. Linda, please. Well, um, I just think about my own situation and being involved with this project and sort of the changes I've seen over the past six or seven years. And um, we're starting to see institutions take a turn for the better for museums to actually let the community curate their stories. And that to me has been a huge transition. And I think that if we can stay on that trend where we're actually telling the story and we're telling the ugly truths 
and also about the contributions and the struggles of people of color. Um, you know, that, that has been left out of mainstream um, textbooks, mainstream dialogue, mainstream films. You know, it's, it's, I think right now we're in a time where it's an opportunity to actually open the dialogue. For example, like tonight, we're doing things like this. Um, I think, you know, if young people can really connect to that and also meet with activists like us here who have been, um, who have strategies, who know what to do in situations, I think that that dialogue between youth and elders and valuing um, those stories, I think, is just vital. I think to know where we came from and, and know those histories, we're honoring our ancestors by doing that, but we're also honoring that story for future generations. Future generations, thank you so much, Linda. Future generations, yeah. We do it for the kids. Thank you. Please, Lauren, if yeah. you can talk about what can we do, you know? How can we get involved, please? Uh, what can you do? Uh, find something you care about. Um, and I guess the reason that I say that is, I keep saying it, but this can't just be a news cycle because that's why people are angry and that's why a lot of bad things have been happening. And I mean, me personally, like, what I've been in it, we'll say five years, and I'm tired, <laughs> and I'm just getting started. But I think the thing that touched me the most is that I went to see the movement, the movie Tubman with Harriet Tubman, and the final scene, um, I realized that she was alive at the same time as my great grandma, and we went to Thanksgiving with her. We went to her hundredth birthday party, and it gives me hope. And at first I was sad. I was like, wow, like someone I knew was alive at the same time as Harriet Tubman. Like I read about slavery in textbooks. Like this, this, this is recent. But what the generation before us has done is unbelievable. Because we had a birthday party for my great grandma. And that wasn't something that could happen when she was born. And so the, the jumps that they've made from then to now we have to make a bigger jump. So find something you care about, and then let's keep it pushing. Because this isn't, this isn't the end of the conversation. We are just getting started. And I, I thank all of you guys for everything that you've done for us. And I, I promise you, we're going to keep going and do more. So thank you. Outstanding. Thank you so much. What an honor to witness it, wonderful stories from you, sharing from the heart. This has been such an honor. And uh, I would like to, you know, now we need to open up to questions and Justin is gonna tell me the questions or he's gonna the, say the questions um, that we are getting feed in Facebook, but also from the wonderful audience. You have been spectacular here today and i have to say audience is everything you know it's like musicians when musicians play and they get all that energy from the audience that's precisely what has happened today this synchronicity this passion about the same the, a topic that is moving us and in a moment that i have to say so urgent in a year of election and i cannot stop talking about the need of voting and the support that we need to give to the young ones to go out and vote um, and with that, I would like if uh, somebody in the audience would like to ask a question. Do we have any questions here from the audience? Oh, yes, we do. This is a little more of a comment. I, I'm the person Linda was talking about who's been here 40 years also. Um, black people have always been a threat. Black people have always been a threat. Um, when, when I moved here, I was told that there was a sign up that not only said no Mexicans, wetback, no dogs, but no niggers also. And I know, by, no, I know people don't want to use that dirty word, but that was what was said. This was KKK country. 
And also, while I was teaching and at Longs Peak, it was called Longs Peak Middle School at that particular time, um, I had a student who would not, a white student who would not do anything I asked her to do. And I finally had a conference with her dad. The dad came in and looked at me. He said, I know why she won't do what you ask her to do. They're going to have to take her out of your class because you're, I've taught her to, to hate black people. So we've always been a threat. And there was, there was a man who lived here be, before Glenda and I moved here. Uh, and I can't use his name because I haven't asked him for permission. He had a cross burnt, burnt on his lawn. He was a property owner, a black person property owner here in Longmont. So black people have always been a threat here. Is there a question you want to ask to the audience? Thank you for sharing. Powerful story. Hi, thank you guys again for um, speaking. Hermione, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my question for you guys would be, uh, do you know any, because th we're all talking about the past, have you guys uh, been aware currently what's being taught within the SVVSD school district, along with any other uh, Boulder County school districts? Um, firsthand, uh, speaking, just graduating the 2018 class, uh, uh, there is a lot more mentioning of a lot of the you know, the dirty history, but important history. Um, and I was just wondering if, I, I never saw a guest speaker come in for any of it. Um, I saw a lot of professors who were very, as we say, the woke ones who put in the effort to go the extra mile and explain. So I was just wondering if there's any community involvement or any, you know, any community representation in there. So, um, I'm on the executive committee of the NAACP. By the way, everyone is welcome to join. It's not just for black people. While it stands for National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, we have 500 plus members. And you know we only make up 1% or so. So you know everybody's not black. Um, but we're doing incredible work both with the St. Vrain Valley School District as well as the Boulder Valley School District because they've been playing minstrels and having people read books like Black Sambo, Little Black Sambo, and things like that. And so we just met with um, uh, Dr. Don Haddad at the beginning of this month, the first Monday night of the month. And then we met with the, um, the Boulder Valley School Superintendent. And so we're starting to break up all of that stuff that's not really, you know, it's not really, well, it is real, but it's not real learning. It's not the truth. It's not really what happened. There are, this, this country is a melting pot and it's built of and made up of bring me your tired and your huddled masses and your poor yearning to be free. I mean, so on one hand we say one thing and on the other we, we do another. So to answer your question, yes, we are working on those issues even as we speak. We should be seeing some changes coming down with the SROs because, well, SROs are school resource officers or policemen, really, or police women. Um, and so we're working with them because a disproportionate number of um, minority kids, children of color, even African Americans, as few as we are, are being chastised and, 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 and uh, being punished for really minor things, and uh, it's not happening to the other. So you should be seeing a difference here, hopefully, soon. I just want to add to that that the Latino History Project has developed a website specifically for teachers that has um, many resources that teachers can use. And we have been offering um, teacher workshops since 2013 every summer 
But we're, you know, we're talking about just a small number of teachers every summer. We've probably trained about 225 teachers from Boulder and St. Brain. And really it's about getting curriculum about Latinos into the classroom. And so it's, it's started. There's lesson plans that we've created. Um, they can refer to that. We've also had um, different community events where we invite the public to come and learn about our history. Uh, so it's slow, but there is an effort. And w at one point, we were part of Boulder Valley School District's professional development and St. Vrain, but it is all based on funding, you know, if they have enough money for this. And so with budget cuts, we are no longer part of their professional development. So, um, you know, that's really ultimately what we were trying to do is to get in the door and st stay with the district so more teachers can be trained about this. I'm glad to hear the progress because um, when we had issues bringing up kids through the St. Vrain district, um, at one point we were addressing the Columbus Day teachings that were going on, which is um, kind of the myth of Columbus in American Americans' eyes. And we, we had a, a sympathetic teacher who was willing to try to teach some more real history. And there's actually curriculum materials that have been developed called Rethinking Columbus. And we asked for that to be implemented within that school and for it to be considered across the district. Well, the teacher was gung-ho, but the principal put the stop on it, saying that the book had been, uh, apparently the book had been banned in Arizona. And we know Arizona's got a weird history of banning books that probably don't need to be banned. Well, somehow to make that, and it, it, we just felt kind of powerless at that point. I mean, we could have pushed it, but then you ha also have to just like make a living so you don't have time to take the district to court necessarily. So to hear progress from a recent grad, um, to hear that you feel like you're learning something is really, is really good is, is my big point with that because I wasn't very hopeful until I heard that. So, Speaking of books, David from Facebook <laughs> would like to hear more of the stories we more about the stories we need to hear. Do you have any recommendations uh, about uh, books or novels that tell these stories that need to be told? Well, the Boulder County Latino History. There's a two volumes to, uh, set, and so that can be purchased on Amazon. But you can also go to labloga.com, and it's a uh, a blog that was started I think about 15 years ago and um, they do a review of uh, Latinx literature and so it's a, and they also um, post once a week and so it's a great blog to become um, aware of what's out there. Any other favorite books, go-to books that you can recommend? I wish, I wish that all of America would read Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by Dee Brown in high school, probably. Bless Me Ultima. It's an all-time classic by Rudolfo Anaya that really captures um, New Mexican um, culture and the values and the importance of family. There's, there's people in the audience also wanting to ask questions. Yes, and I do have one more from Facebook before we move on. Um, well, someone wants to know how we keep meeting, well, Deborah from Facebook wants to know, how do we keep meeting and so that we can continue to learn and grow? Uh, I know that LMAC, Longmont Multicultural Action Committee, is looking at uh, creating more forums for public dialogue. Anyone else? The museum will, of course, continue to hold these kinds of talks. Well, I know that the Museum of Boulder also is starting a new series that's called Voces Vivas. And uh, it's a series that is leading up to an exhibit that they are going to have in 2021. But they're really inviting the community to share their stories. So if you go to their website, you can find out more information about that. Thank you. Um, I'm Strider. I've uh, been here 15 years, and 
I was on the bridge with John Lewis 55 years ago in Selma. I got knocked out twice. I was, things were pretty severe in those days. I worked with SNCC and SCLC both. And I've given a keynote address at uh, uh, MLK Day along with Glenda. And uh, I wanted to point out the Ku Klux Klan started organizing in Colorado in 1921. And there weren't enough black people really to target like they did in Tulsa with the Tulsa massacre. So they organized to target Catholics and immigrants. And they went, that was their main focus here. Uh, but they were, they took over Longmont and Boulder and Denver and a number of other towns, but they never could organize in Pueblo or Colorado Springs. Now, I wonder, in Pueblo, they organized the NAACP back in 1908 in Pueblo. We only organized in Boulder three years ago. But uh, 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 after the shooting in 1980 here on uh, 9th and Main, or uh, 11th and Main, I forget which, um, uh, El Comité organized. And there's been a lot more consciousness developed since then. And you know, with Mike Butler and Dan Benavides doing the community walks. And the gang activity has been really down. And Longmont has been a very more progressive and more humane city during this time. Could anyone up there comment about, and I appreciate hearing from you, Linda, about the 30s, which I didn't know. but. Uh, how we build more of a community with more of this history and stories to be uh, to get people understanding why and how to make ourselves a culturally uh, uh, functional city and progressive. Thank you. Yeah, um, one of the things that I recognize from uh, from that incident when we were, actually that was when I was growing up. I mean, L Louis was a neighbor to me. He, my dad was a mentor to Louis. Um, so, and the Cordova family were extended family, community family. So Longmont has a number of families that are generationally connected that are familia, you know? It's where we have support each other when somebody has died or somebody has gotten sick or as somebody is um, elderly. So these families are interconnected. And one of the things that I recognized from that time where the, the leaders came together and really worked at coming together with um, social justice and creating change for um, our community. And they were strong. And some of the things that I recognize now is that what Longmont has done is um, similar to like the, the history is they formed together an alliance, but they actually outreached to some of their resources and used allies to be supportive with them to make change. So now currently we actually see that, that same structure still continuing and we keep, we keep growing that. With, we have, um, I really am proud of the relationships we build with the school districts and the relationships we build within, you know, working with our police departments. There was a time when community policing was really important and it showed because we had officers involved with community members and we were all, there was working together and I feel, still feel like that is happening now that, you know, when we're looking at change. There's groups now and or, um, committees meeting around, you know, um, around changes that are happening in the school district or policies within the police department or, you know, or um, equity in the school district. So, you know, I'm really excited to be a part of those committees because I, that's still part of like the history that is coming forth from what was being, what had been developed in the beginning of what Longmont and the community were um, creating um, er early on. Um, I've gone to other cities and we've gone to other uh, communities and they're like, how does Longmont really have such great resources in our community? And how does Longmont really 
work with some of the 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 things that need to be spoke about uh, the being real so um yeah maybe that's a little bit about the history that i've known and still knowing that some of those leaders are still at watching and still part of our community is really really valuable i just want to add um to what Louis said, I was on a panel with Chief Mike Butler, actually, his last week <laughs> uh, as chief. How many of us in here knew that Longmont got a national award for being the number three um, city in the country for community policing? Who, who knew that? And if we didn't, this is this is my point we're not sharing the good news and we're not you know just and as you said just because of the work that Dan Benavides and Mike Butler have done walking the neighborhoods and talking with the people so and everything went down they don't have he says he doesn't hire any police who have a record of, of excessive force or any of that so um, I think that's important, but it's important for all of us to know that too, to know the successes and pass them on. Super important, yes. I'm afraid we only have time for two more questions. All right, so my question comes from a Facebook crew as well. And first, I am so thankful for everything and the work that you guys are doing in terms of the history project. So I'm going to say some of my pieces uh, first, as well as um, some of the things that you talked to about starting the discussions. With that, this question is very specific, and maybe, Lauren, you can give us some insight there, too. We've had a lot of discussions in the past. And we still have some challenges here in Longmont. I don't want us to forget that. What are some of the action that is currently going on to address some of the shortcomings and shortfalls? And this is coming from a youth of color, um, specifically black in the area. So Lauren, if you want to address it, or anyone else, I'd love to hear it. Uh, thank you. Threw me a uh, nice softball there. So I've been doing a lot of work with the Boulder County Collective. And so we're a group of uh, young people, and we've kind of got four different pillars. Um, so if you guys are ever looking for ways to get involved, that's how we're doing it. So we've got housing, we've got public safety, we've got education, and we've got another one that is just escaping me right now. Um, and so those are just the types of, of, of that's the type of work. So if you see the march that we did, I think about a month back through Longmont, that was the Boulder County Collective. Um, we've actually got the head of the housing department here as well, and I'm heading up education. So there is a lot of work that is being done because there are a lot of problems that we need to fix. Um, so yeah, thanks for that softball, Hermine. <laughs> Thank you. I'm uh, Ray Ramirez. I have a comment first and then a question. Uh, my comment is that, uh, you know, th this country was built on lies, and it still is. You know, these lies are perpetuated from generation to generation to generation. Our education system teaches those lies, and it continues to do so. And I think it's incumbent on each one of us to do whatever we can in our power to change that. You know, there, there's not a, a week that goes by. I'm 75 years old. And there's not a week that has gone by in my lifetime where I haven't heard about the Holocaust in Germany. You know, either TV, magazines, newspapers, we're always reminded of that. And we should be. But when do we ever hear about the Holocaust that happened here? The tens of millions of native people that died. When do we hear that? We don't, ever. You know, and it all comes down to education and the lack of it. 
uh, my question is for Brett. You know, I know one of the projects you're working on are peacemaking circles. You know, and I've always seen this as a really, really important step. Could you explain a little bit about what you do with the indigenous peacemaking circles? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, so I, I generally work with tribes who have their own courts that were provided to, them, provided to them, required of them by the United States, generally in the 1930s as part of what's called the Indian reorganization. Those are adversarial models, much like any old you know, state, state court. Um, and they don't work just like our courts don't work so well in the outside here. Um, but on top of that, the courts are funded at about a third of need. And so they're, you know, they're doomed to fail. So what tribes have said is, look, our people got along. Somehow they, they coexisted for thousands of years together and dealt with problems that come up for humans living in community. And what did they do? So they want to recover what they used to do and put that into something that would be a more modern alternative forum. So I help them set that up. It's really a pretty simple process for the most part. There's a lot of art to it, but it's really treating each other as humans face to face. Um, you lose the hierarchy. It's, it's hard to believe if you don't come from a different culture. If, if, you, if you come from a different culture and look at what we have, we have all this hierarchy and, and all this privilege just in the perpetuation of privilege. Think about when you go into court, the judge is up there. You're down here, you have to hire somebody who can speak for you, and they speak in a different language, basically a specialized professional language for you. Put that in the context of maybe two parents fighting over who wants to spend more time with a kid, and that's not very good to, to fight it out as hard as you can and even hire a bully to fight it out harder for you. And I'm a lawyer, so I can say that. You know, to fight a boy, you know, and the more money you have, the, the better fighter you can get and some neutral third party decides, and really the kid's in the middle of that, right? When you talk about familia, how does familia de deal with it when the parents are messing up? They sit down and talk about it, right? And maybe somebody's got some more standing because they're older or they're an expert, but everybody knows that. They don't have to sit in the pr position of privilege and shut people up with a gavel when they start talking, right? So it's a matter of sitting down and talking to people with respect for one another and realizing that everybody around the circle talking about something brings a different perspective and that has value. And they may be seeing things in a different way that is going to make an outcome come better. So, can you, that's my passion. <laughs> it's my chante or my corazon or my heart. <laughs> and that, so that's a better way to, to, to do things. And that's, you know, why, why a forum like this is important. Yep. It's also why we all need to get out and tell at least five people to vote. Um, we're really in a, in a time right now where... Yeah. The, the, the claws with which privilege and white supremacy grabs on, and, and people, I don't think they even know it sometimes, but the, the degree to which they just clutch at it and won't let it go. Um, it's absolutely unbelievable, and we're fighting that right now, and we're fighting a pushback about that feeling threatened. And I, you know, I don't need to go into any details about that, but if, if you're uncomfortable with the world right now and the way that we're living, by gosh, we gotta, we got to make a huge change, and that means we personally have to get other people to vote because the, the, the momentum is for people to be lazy and not vote, especially those who we would like to have voting are not doing it. You can rest darn well that the people who are feeling threatened by, by positive changes are, are motivated. They're out there ready. You can see their stands popping up anywhere with flags and bumper stickers and screaming and all of that. Well, um, the people need to do that. The real people, the humans who are ready to te treat each other with respect need to do that. So let's get out and do that. Let's get out and vote. Thank you so much, Brett Lee Shelton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you to the Longmont Museum, really. Thank you so much for hosting us tonight. I want to thank Thank the audience that has been unbelievable, spectacular. I also want to you know, really thank Glenda Robinson for being here, teaching us, sharing us so, with so much heart tonight. And also Luis Lopez for everything, all the stories, everything that you give to the community. Uh, Lauren Jenkins, I want to know about that movie that you mentioned. I want to, now that we are in quarantine, we watch a lot of movies. I want to know about that. And thank you so much for your passion. Linda Arroyo, as always, thank you so much. I want to thank again Justin for 
opening this wonderful venue tonight. I want to say thank you again for hosting us. This has been an amazing conversation. Um, and I'm pretty sure this is going to continue and it's going to make the Longmont community stronger. This is just the beginning of these voices of change, a history of race and social justice in Longmont. Thank you so much. Good night to everybody. Let's, let's, let's thank Rosanna Longo for a great moderating job this evening. Yeah. And I also want to thank the Longmont Multicultural Action Committee and Adriana Pereira for her help in making this happen. And please uh, feel free to check us out on the web, longmontmuseum.org, for more information on upcoming programs. Uh, special thanks to KGNU, our media sponsor, the Scientific Cultural and Facilities District, and all of our museum members and donors. And thank you, audience, and everyone online for joining us this evening. Have a good one. Vote. <laughs>